there are benefits to negative experiences, all right? Um, for example, uh, sorrow tenderizes the heart. You know, anger orients us uh, to injustices and, and energizes us around them. You know, remorse helps us stay on the high road and so forth. You know, anxiety alerts us to real threats. So there's a place for these, okay? Negative experiences can increase resilience. Uh, it's, there's a saying in medicine, you know, good judgment comes from experience, but experience comes from bad judgment, right? And... Uh, I've had a lot of, I now have really, really good judgment as a rock climber. Well, it's because I had a lot of bad experiences due to bad judgment. But yet those experiences in some ways are what I call up, you know, as a kind of emotional memory when I'm facing difficulties here today. All right? Okay. But would anyone in this room like more negative experiences? Wait, no, any of those? No, no, you want to kind of give you some of mine? Look around the world. Look at my face. Look at the people on the evening news, look at the people in the street walking by, you know, there's a lot of difficulty, there's a lot of sorrow, there's a lot of loss, there's a lot of stress in life, a lot of frustration, a lot of dissatisfaction, a lot of irritation, uh, a lot of sadness, a lot of fear. Um, there's no shortage of negative experiences out there in the world. And negative experiences have significant consequences, very significant consequences that need to be netted against whatever their positive benefits may be. Psychological consequences of negative experiences, you know, because again, uh, this is a proxy for the research on stress. Uh, it lowers the mood, increases pessimism, uh, makes people more irritable and anxious, uh, learn helplessness, as I said, um, and it kind of tends to uh, reduce approach behaviors in, for many people, although not necessarily so much for women, which is an interesting finding. The point is that stress or negative experiences have a number of negative consequences. So, what do we do about this? You know, as I said in the very beginning, you know, Mother Nature uh, has given us this extraordinary brain. You know, the more I learn about the brain, the more grateful I feel, really. You know, I, who, I, I couldn't earn the build-out instructions. None of us earned the build-out instructions of the brain that came to us on the day we were conceived, all right? Uh, on the other hand, even though the home base of the brain truly is a state of calm, um, contentment, and caring, we get so quickly driven from home, you know? Uh, basically, if you think about it, there are two kinds of mistakes a person can make in life, what, you know? Or, you know, a, a caveman, cavewoman, uh, monkey, squirrel, or iguana, right? You can think there is a tiger in the bushes when there really is no tiger, okay? Or you can think the coast is clear, it's all just fine, and there really is a tiger there about to get you. Mother Nature wants us to make the first mistake a thousand times over to avoid making the second mistake even once. Because if you make the first mistake, you're just anxious. What if, if you're going to be dead by your 30th birthday, right? But if you make the second mistake, whoosh, no more grandkids, no more gene copies, all right? So that tendency, that um, inclination is alive and well generically in the brain today. And that takes me to the good news portion of my presentation here. We can deliberately use the mind to change the brain over time for the better. And now I want to talk about a major way to do it, one of my favorite methods, which is taking in the good. Just having positive experiences, including grateful ones, I, don't, I think is not enough. If a person just feels grateful for a few seconds, that's nice, right? That's better than feeling resentful or bitter for a few seconds, okay? But the brain doesn't have enough time unless it's an intense experience of gratitude, like a Chilean miner released, you know, from thousands of feet below. Um, just having that experience alone is not enough. We need to stay with those experiences, and we need to take steps consciously to keep that spotlight of attention there so that, you know, we really suck that good experience into the brain. So how to actually do this? These are the three steps of what I think of as how to take in the good. First step, let a good fact become a good experience. Let the needle move. So often we go through life and some good thing has happened. It's a little thing often. Uh, you know, we got something done. We folded the laundry. We got the, you know, kids to bed. We survived another day at work. Um, you know, the flowers are blooming. It's a nice misty rain out there. I like this kind of weather myself personally and so forth. Hey, there's an opportunity to, there to feel good. Don't leave money lying on the table. In other words, let yourself feel good. That's the first step. Second step, really savor it. 
Practice what any school teacher knows. If you want to help people learn something, make it um, as intense as possible, as multimodal or felt in the body as possible, and as long as possible. And then, as you sink into it, sense an intent that it is sinking into you. That's the third step of taking in the good. Sometimes people do this with a visualization, like a golden light coming in, or a soothing balm going down inside. You could imagine a jewel going into the treasure chest in your heart, or just a knowing somehow that this experience is sinking into you, becoming a resource you can take with you wherever you go. Thank you.